Let's start by giving you a little bit of an introduction to the background of Kerberos. So mythologically, the word itself was a character that guarded the gates to Hades. Some would say this is an appropriate name given how much difficulty they had with it, but that's just the background. Kerberos, the authentication protocol, was actually developed by MIT and in Windows 2000 was adopted as the default authentication protocol for Windows itself. Now all flavors of Kerberos itself provide authentication, however the Microsoft implementation does provide extensions for authorization as well. So what does that mean for you? That Kerberos is the default authentication protocol for Active Directory. This protocol is based on a trusted third party model and provides a mechanism for authentication and mutual authentication. We'll kind of delve into that in a moment. Kerberos is also based on tickets containing client credentials that are encrypted with a shared set of keys. Now let's get into some common misconceptions with Kerberos. First of all, Kerberos is not a Microsoft or application specific thing. That should have been obvious when we talked about Kerberos from MIT days, etc. Kerberos is not something that you have to install in the Microsoft world as it is the default authentication protocol. It's not something you enable. This is true in general, but does have exceptions, particularly in the SharePoint world. And contrary to a lot of people's opinions, it actually is a very good thing. So speaking of these good things, let's take a look at some of the benefits that you get with Kerberos. First of all, we have the authentication interoperability. That is with Unix systems that also run Kerberos where you can interoperate between, between those two environments. You can do things such as impersonation that we get into a little bit more later. Kerberos is faster. There are a lot of efficiencies that you gain in the traffic that goes on in a normal authentication request. You also get some, some other various things. I won't read them to you on the screen, but another big piece that was enabled with the advent of Kerberos is the use of smart cards in an Active Directory environment. So now let's go into some of the basic concepts and definitions that are, you're going to hear throughout uh, any type of Kerberos talk or project. The key distribution center, the user principal name, the service principal name or SPN, delegation of authentication or impersonation in some respects, constrained delegation and protocol transition. Let's start off with the KDC or key distribution center. The KDC is that trusted third party that we talked about in, in a previous slide, and it's made up of two subservices, the authentication service that actually verifies you, and the ticket granting service that hands you those tickets that will be used later on for access to uh, different resources in your environment. The KDC itself holds copies of each entity or user's master key and the KDC issues keys that are encrypted with the master key to each entity. This concept of keys and how it's encrypted with which uh, is very important in the Kerberos environment. And as we go through this, you'll start to see uh, more and more of that coming through. Let's dig into the role of SPNs and UPNs, as this is where the vast majority of the problems are going to come into play. First of all, the UPN is very simple. It's a, a user's principal name. It's their username of sorts. Now the SPN, think of this as the username for a program and it uses this username to identify what key is going to be used for encryption. So think of this as an username for an application and the only way you can talk to that application is by addressing it by its username. Now this username itself has some intricacies. It has to be laid out in such a way that it can be addressable. So it's made up of, th of a couple of different pieces. The first part being the service name. And in this case, we see on the screen, it's HTTP. 
The second part is the host name, and we see here it's moss.k2.com. Now that's the fully qualified name, uh, but we'll get into to pieces of that later. Now the third optional piece that can be uh, as part of this uh, service principal name is the port number. Now keep in mind the port number is not something that you can just decide to add. Uh, we'll get into pieces of that later for IIS, but rather it's dictated by the client application. So uh, don't, don't mess with that unless it's absolutely necessary to add. So let's take a look at a good example here of some service principal names that are associated with K2. So since K2 created these applications and we control the, the client and the server portion, we created the service type of K2 server. Now in this particular case, the K2 server is running on a machine that fully qualified domain name is k2server.k2.com. And we know the client will be looking for this on port 5252. So we need to register that, uh, that port number as part of the application's username that we're trying to identify. And you can see that repeated here with k 2 server dot k2.com on a different port as well. Now both of those are different usernames that have to be addressed. And you can see a, a variety of the other uh, service principal names, etc. that are, are part of that. Let's move on. A little bit more on, on the SPN that I, that I kind of alluded to in terms of the ports. Uh, ports are not required on service principal names on any IIS sites that use the default ports. So there's no need to add port 80 or port 443 to, to any piece there. And a best practice is to use the, both the NetBIOS and fully qualified domain name. And you saw that in this slide where the SPNs listed out are for both. 